Hey everybody, how's it going? Hope you're having a lovely day. One of the things I've gone over on this channel over the years is right to repair. Right to repair is the idea that you should be able to fix what you own. And companies have been kind of going out of their way to create these artificial restrictions and limitations in the supply chain that used to not exist, that you cannot fix what you bought and paid for. As Kyle Wiggins at iFixit has said many times, if you can't fix it, do you own it? I would argue, no, you don't. You are renting it. And something that I've been really trying to draw people's attention to over the past several years are all these areas where companies across all industries have been taking part in these practices to just slowly erode the definition of ownership as the years go by, even when we're not talking about repair. Whether we're talking about purchasing content where it says purchase on the product page and the company calls it a purchase and page 21 of the end user license agreement says that you're not actually purchasing anything, you're purchasing a temporary, completely revocable license that we can take away at any given time to actually view this. And if we do revoke it, you don't get your money back. Or we're talking about uh, the companies that say, you're purchasing this, it's a purchase, but you know we're just going to have it on our servers. So you, you just, just trust us. That's exactly what wrong here. It's going to be on our servers. It, like, you, you could use it whenever you want, you know, unless you decide to, of course, I don't know, move to another country and actually want to read your book. And that's what we're going to be going over today. Uh, there's, I, I'm not smart as a business owner. I really am not. Uh, like, sometimes you guys give me too much credit. I have about 2 million subscribers. This channel gets like 2 to 9 million views a month. The amount of money that I could make if I just took some basic ass audible.com sponsorship offer is like, like, Three to nine thousand dollars a month, to the point where when I, you know, when I travel and I'm staying in a motel, I might not be in a place that by default puts a sofa in front of a fucking door. But there's an overarching principle here, which is that I do not want to live in a world where my children spend fifteen or thirty or fifty dollars on a book that can literally be removed from their account if a delivery person thinks that my children have a racist doorbell or they make a video about the doorbell on YouTube. And that is the world that we live in right now. This is a very interesting post that was highlighted by Wasim al -Kurdi. He is a regular contributor on Matrix and he's a friend of the channel. Thank you very much for pointing me to this particular post. This is on Twitter from Rohit. This is bloody absurd, Amazon. So when you move countries, you just lose all your Kindle books. What the hell? And he's referring to this chat with Amazon. I'm really sorry to inform you that the eBooks cannot be moved also. And he says, well, what happens when a household moves countries? You just lose everything. And, you know, it kind of goes back to here. And he says, like, nobody moves in Amazon's world. Your purchased books will remain as it is under your Amazon account on which you have purchased them. In this case, you can access the eBooks on your UK Amazon account by visiting amazon.com slash UK dot co dot UK slash my CD in your browser. I am really sorry to inform you that the UK Amazon account cannot be moved to the US Amazon account. You can use the same email address to create a US Amazon account, but to access the purchases which are made in the UK, you are required to log in using the UK website of Amazon due to geographical restrictions. And to access US purchases, you need to log into US website. Do you know when I do not have geographical restrictions on a book that I have bought and paid for? When it is paper, I ordered a book, it showed up in this packaging, somebody delivered it to my door, and I can read about all sorts of cool stuff. If I want to read a self-help book, I can read that. If I want to read a programming book, I can read that. If I want to read a history book, I buy it, and all the pages are right here. Nobody can take it away from me. I can take this book to New York. God forbid, I'm not going to lie. I could take this book to New Hampshire. I could take this book to Texas. I could take this book to Colorado. I could take this book to Dubai. I could take this thing wherever I want. I guess they could try to take the book from me in New York, but in Texas, they can fuck around and find out. In all seriousness, why can't you simply sell me the book in a format where there's like a, even a 3% chance that if your customer service does something stupid, that I can actually retain property rights over what I bought and paid for? Or at the very least, if you're going to take accountability and responsibility for hosting what it is that I've paid and purchased, that you actually live up to that responsibility and allow me to take my property from one country to another. My grandmother immigrated here almost a hundred years ago. She was a poor, broke-ass immigrant. She came here from a mountain town in Italy that had like 90 people in it. She had to sell her, her sheep and her chickens and everything that she owned to get one ticket to America. She took everything that she had, including a book, here in a little bag that was sitting on the end of a broomstick. My immigrating grandmother almost a hundred years ago had more property rights to her book than Amazon grants you in 2024. Let that sink in. And I still have one of those books that she passed down to my mother that is sitting in my home library on my shelf today. That book may not be there if we had 2024 our definitions of property rights in the early 1900s. And it really drives home the point that regardless of all the technological innovation, the improvement in mortality rates, the improvement in medicine, the improvement in science and everywhere else, that in this one small area, we are just literally behind where we were even three or 400 years ago. Meanwhile, Amazon website has this, which if you carefully follow, does absolutely nothing 
something at the end. Transfer your Kindle content to another country or region. If your country or region has changed, you can transfer Kindle content you've purchased to match your new local Amazon marketplace. Kindle Unlimited subscription can be transferred. And it tells you how to transfer your content, which, of course, as he says, uh, doesn't actually work. Anyway, so if he's going to, uh, he sends this to the customer service representative who says, in this case, I would request you please visit this link and you'll be contacted directly by UK Amazon Customer Care Service as the contents are available on Amazon.co.uk site and they'll be able to see the contents and will be checked for transfer option if available on their end. He misspelled there. But again, what do you, what, what do you expect from somebody that uh, doesn't understand rights or personal property? You can add, log into the account from Amazon.co.uk and be able to access the content. Uh, he says that there is an error and uh, right after saying that there was an error, uh, the guy uh, uh, left. So essentially, he says you could access it by doing this. It says your content and device preferences are set up to this. Uh, this is when I click and it shows nothing. And yes, th th that is when the guy's like, okay, I give up. He has left the chat and they gave up. After three different customer service representatives in an hour, he was finally able to get access to his book back because he was a good boy and he followed the rules and he went through all the customer service hurdles. He was able to get access to, again, what anybody who purchased a paper book gets access to immediately. I have, how many people here have had to call customer service because the paper book that they purchased stopped being supported because they moved to a different geographic location? And again, I completely understand the benefit of not having to carry paper. I understand the benefit of being able to transmit this electronically. But we don't live in a world where I can spend money and get a PDF that is unrestricted of a fucking book. We live in a world where many of these companies want to have it on their server, which means they can revoke access to it at any time. And we're talking about Amazon. We're talking about a company where you should be worried about them revoking your access at any given time. As I said last year, a man had a doorbell. The delivery person thought that the doorbell was racist. Because of this, he had his entire Amazon account shut down for a certain period of time, and it didn't work. This made it to national news. Only after Amazon confirmed this on national news did I follow up on this story, and when I did so, my own account ended up in the... In the uh doghouse at Amazon. And this is, a, this, this is an issue. When you purchase content, I have no problem with technological evolution. I have no problem with using your phone or your tablet or your laptop or your watch or whatever the hell else. You, if you want to read a book on your watch, you do you. What I have an issue with is the fact that we used to buy something and get what we paid for. And now there's this leash, there's this tether that attaches the person who sold me something to the product that I've purchased to the point we don't, we can't really even necessarily call it a purchase anymore. And, and, and that's what's bothering me about this entire situation. We have been conditioned to believe that this is okay. And every single time I see some fucking audible sponsorship on YouTube, I see more and more people that are, that have influence, that have a million or two million or five million or eight million subscribers that are conditioning people that watch them and look up to them to believe that there's absolutely nothing wrong with spending spending money on something that you don't own. Maybe I'm a bad businessman, but I would prefer that my children live in a world where when they purchase something, they actually own it, then I get a couple of extra affiliate bucks in the short term that would allow me when I'm traveling to stay at a motel that is put together by somebody that understands that you don't put a sofa in front of a fucking door. But what are you gonna do? Uh, in, in all seriousness, like the, the, the short term push for not only convenience at the point of customers and also, you know, let's be real, cash at all the people that are trying to push people away from getting books that they own into this perpetual rental cycle with crap like Audible are, I, I don't think that this is going to be good for society and I don't like the fact that every single fucking industry is going into this to the point where you may have to opt out of certain things entirely if you want to be able to say that you actually own something. I want my kids to live in a world where when they buy something, they own it. That, in my opinion, is more important than a couple of thousand dollars of sponsorship money up front. And that's damn well more important than the convenience in the moment of clicking a button and having somebody else read a book to me. Would I like to click a button and have somebody in the moment read a book to me? Absolutely. But I'm not going to pay for that anymore unless I get an Opus file or a Vorbis file or something else that I can play on my device when I want. And you're probably not going to want to give that to me because the entire content industry is so focused on control, 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 always focused on control, never focusing on how to make the experience better for the end consumer, which is why things like piracy continue to explode in popularity all around the world after it had a decrease over all these years. You finally got piracy to start going 
going down, but there's this one study I went over from the EU a while ago, where like right around a few years ago, it really kind of started to pop up again. And it's because more and more companies are taking part in this anti-consumer bullshit, where you're actually telling them out loud, yeah, you don't own this. Just in case you wondered, just in case you thought that was reading me paranoid, there actually is. You don't own this, and we can take it away from you at any time. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. And by the way, somebody asked this in the last video, so I just want to answer, what type of mic is this? I didn't have it in the description. This is a DPA 4066. This is usually what I use when I'm traveling or away from my standard microphone setup. I also used to use a 4066 or a 4065 when I would record board repair videos in the store. There's a few reasons I use this, and I'll just kind of walk you through them. For Obviously, if you... If you Feel free to turn off the video at this point if you have no interest in microphones. So this is a microphone that gets used by everything from Cirque du Soleil to a lots of Broadway shows in New York City. Lots of really high-end Broadway shows use this because it's a very high-quality microphone that if you wanted to, you could hide and you usually see them wearing this somewhere in the hair. There's all, this is the version that I have right now with the hooks. The version I usually recommend is this because it's, it's kind of, instead, the, see how this is kind of like multiple pieces? This one over here is kind of like one piece, so I prefer. It just kind of feels better. And now, this is not a, uh, this is not a cardioid microphone. A cardioid microphone is a microphone that only picks up stuff essentially in front of it, but it rejects everything from around it. This is an omnidirectional. Why do I use that? If you're using a cardioid microphone and it's like a U87 or an AKG 414 or like, you know, audio Technic 4050, it's in front of you and it's far enough away that if you move a little bit, it's not going to really mess with stuff that much, but it's going to, obviously you'll have less room crap because it, it is a cardioid. When you have a head-worn microphone and it's this close to the audio source in your mouth, it even, it even moves like a little bit like that, or if the microphone moves away like this, rather than the uh, just the sound going down in volume, when you have a cardioid microphone right next to you, rather than at one of these omnis, what happens is the entire sound signature changes. It's not just that you wind up with a little difference in volume like you do if I go from here to here. You wind up with some sort of radically different sound signature as well as radically different volume as a result. Because like, again, you know, this is just a big difference. From over here, there's not a big difference if I do this. But when you're right this close up, like like a mild difference in angle means everything. So an omnidirectional is good. Also, since it's omnidirectional, it means that I don't have to worry about proximity effects or any of that junk, which means the microphone can go as close to my mouth as possible. If the microphone is as close to my mouth as possible, that means that I have the highest signal to noise ratio. Again, the noise is over there and the signal, which is my mouth, is over here. Or, you know, de depending on whether you like this channel or not, you may consider the signal over there and the noise over here. But in all seriousness, this, uh, this would allow me back when I did border pair videos to have a very, very loud hot air station on my desk and a very, very loud fume extractor under my desk, and as long as I would speak loudly and clearly, you would hear it, you'd know it's there, but it wouldn't really be as overbearing as it would be if I had a shotgun microphone up there, where my voice would be the same volume, if not lower, than the actual hot air station and the fume extractor. So it allowed me to run all this really, really loud equipment around me and still be heard well. So not only is it good for the high signal noise ratio, DPA usually also makes, in my opinion, when it comes to head-worn microphones, the best capsules money can buy. Again, to be clear, uh, I'm not sponsored, never gotten a discount on their stuff. They've never given me money. They're just good stuff. Now you may wonder, Lewis, who the F is going to spend $890 on a microphone or 600 bucks on it? And that is a very good question. This is not, I have never spent more than about 160, 150, maybe 170 something dollars on one of these microphones. And very often I've spent less than $80. How is that? Well, again, this headband, since it gets used by, again, lots of Broadway shows or delay stuff, stuff like that, they, it's very common for them to become damaged. And for people that work at the rental companies that issue this stuff or like, you know, the companies that it winds up getting passed down to, when they're selling everything, they can't really tell what's good and what's bad. So if they see the headband is bent, they'll think, wow, this is radically reduced value. And when the plug is broken off or that's not working, or when they plug it in, it doesn't work, they'll assume that the microphone is dead. And sometimes you can get these for as low as 20 or 40 bucks. You know, if you're somebody that doesn't really know better, you may not realize that this thing that looks like a coat hanger, if it has scratches on it, is worth eight or $900. And you may wind up selling it for way cheaper than you should. So a lot of the ones that I've bought have been ones that were straightened out or that were essentially like, you know, they were in, in really poor condition. And first thing you do is when you get the microphone, you know, you just kind of bend it back to the shape of your head so you can put it on your head. And the second thing that's really useful to do is you replace the plug. So usually I replace the plug with that is usually broken on the other end or ripped off with something like this. Neutrik makes some of the best plugs you can get. Again, not sponsored, nothing like that. They just make good stuff. Been using it since 2007. And you can solder this on the end. And again, this is a fairly high quality plug. If you get one of these over here, it's this, this will most likely outlive you. And then you'll be able to plug it into any interface of your choice. 
case. Uh, when I'm traveling, again, I, I like to use a Zoom H1N. That's what I plug into this, uh, this computer over here. You can even plug the Zoom H1N into a smartphone. So I'm not kidding because most headsets that I've tried, and I've tried almost all of them, the gaming headsets, garbage microphone, uh, you know, any of those fancy over the ear ones like the the you know the Bose Quiet Comfort Sony XM4 garbage microphone you get ones with a good microphone anything with a good microphone tends to have absolutely you know no ability to isolate noise and just garbage music listening experience so one of the things i actually do not kidding is i actually walk around with this and then i use this as my listening because these are some sure ionic IEMs they block out like 20 to 30 dB of outside noise and also have really good accurate sound reproduction. And I plug that into the Zoom and then I have this microphone plugged in and I'm essentially carrying all this stuff around wired as I make my phone calls. And you may think it's ridiculous, but guess what? There can be 30 miles an hour of wind outside and construction going on and people hear me as if they're watching Cirque du Soleil. Anyway, that's it for today. And as always,